Hello buddy, it's Wyvern here with a video to discuss the upcoming Legendary Lords for the Shadow and the Blade and what they're likely to bring to the table. Campaign wise, um, what they could, their introduction can entail, how it can shake things up, and uh, what what they're going to be bringing to make them a bit unique and uh, make them stand out. So I will note Rapunz de Leoness did not does not have a page, obviously that doesn't really get done for free LC lords it seems and uh, we don't necessarily know what exactly she's going to come with uh, we do know that she is supposed to be on the vortex map so Bertoni will finally have a vortex presence and uh, supposedly uh, Henry Massif her uh, unique legendary hero is supposed to be unique to her sub faction so you will not be able to get him for other Bretonian sub factions from what I have gathered uh, but besides that, we don't necessarily know what she's going to be bringing to the table, and most likely we'll find out in the coming days, uh, if not at release. Now, without further ado, let's dive in and discuss the two DLC Legendary Lords. So first and foremost, we do have Deathmaster Snitch. Now, uh, Snitch, of course, does come in with Clan Eshin, and he his faction does get the shadowy dealings actions. These are essentially mini quests or uh, assignments designed to give you certain rewards, and... Um, Something a little bit in the line of, well, you do, you do get random quests as any faction, but something a little bit in the lines of uh, a vein of Elithinar's quests or um, the uh, or blessed spawning quests or that sort of thing. And uh, can pr potentially provide some decent, most likely will sort of be providing some decent benefits to Clan Eshin because Clan Eshin does have some limitations and some hindrances for sure. Uh, especially in Mortal Empires, I, I would think their start might be a little bit iffy. So we'll certainly see how it plays out. Now, recruitment cost. This is one of the, this is really one of the big fact. I'd argue this might actually be the biggest sort of, uh, element or limitation of clan action that is the recruitment cost being plus 200 percent for all non-eshin units as far as i can tell there's no way to remove this um i do not believe there is a from what i've seen there's no sort of uh up up uh purchase cheapening in his in uh in snitch's skills and um from what i understand unlike 10 and 1 who can once he's completed certain uh certain rituals he can get access to the or certain bits of the rights of sotek he can get access to saurus at normal cost this does not seem to be the case for snake uh, i'm not entirely sure if this does include all generic rat units so that means clan rats stormmen um that's skaven slaves i guess uh, i'm not sure if that includes those or if it simply means everything that's from scryer molder or uh pestilence so not entirely sure there if that's what the if the recruitment cost will only increase will only imp impact other clans units or all literally all non eshin units including generic skaven ones but um it's definitely going to be tough early game i think because by late game you usually have enough money you're floating off resources plus you're not really churning out new armies constantly so you don't really care too much about increased recruitment costs but um in early game especially if you until you can get a settlement to fast tech to tier three and get some decent eshin units out uh of course assuming that his units are not way down tiered or his eshin units are not way down tiered uh so by the time you can get those decent units up, it might be a little difficult to sort of flesh out your army. Uh, it's definitely going to force you to shy away from artillery-heavy play, which is normally a staple of Skaven builds, in my experience. Uh, in campaign, you try to just spam artillery, or, or in Ikit's case, guns, and uh, not really care about a decently well-rounded army. Uh, and I think that's not really going to be an option here with for Snake. He's going to have to go for Eshin units. Now, Clan Loyalty, Eshin Lords never defect. Now, I don't think this is a huge game changer because really, in my experience, your Lords do not defect unless you really screw up somewhere. Um, perhaps others have had different experiences in basically every Skaven campaign I've played in recent times. Um, Lord Loyalty has not been an issue. Uh, the only time Lord Loyalty really comes to the effect, in my experience, is when you try to disband an army, and that could be beneficial. The fact that you don't have to worry about a rogue army suddenly being at, uh, or attacking you in your back lines is nice. It means you can simply disband an army if you don't want them. You can make an emergency army in, if you're about to be attacked from an unexpected angle, and then disband them within like three turns once they've used up their usefulness without risk of rebellion, which is certainly an improvement. But besides that, um, 
I don't think it's a huge game changer. And finally, Night Runners and Gutter Runners get armor piercing warp infused projectiles. Now, if this means they simply get like a weeping blade or armor centering effect, or if it means they literally get AP, I'm not sure. If they do get AP, that is going to be pretty nuts. That could make them very, very powerful range units, and means unfortunately that the Eshin clan is basically going to be another, just another projectile spam faction. It is something that I kind of don't like about Skaven is that melee builds are not super competitive right now in campaign. You don't really want to go into melee with them. Uh, even if you're a more melee oriented clan, you'll much rather go with artillery. The only fa sub faction for Skaven right now that I think is solid in melee is maybe Tretch, but even there I feel you're better off with artillery and then pestilence because you can get such cheap plague monks and just spam those. But yeah, not, not not sure if this is necessarily the greatest idea. It means that units like Death Runner, the value of units like Death Runners or the Eshin Triads might be devalued, but uh, we will see. Of course, he doesn't get him out. Lord Effects, better ambush success chance. Keep in mind, Skaven get offensive ambush, so it will synergize with that nicely, but it's nothing huge. Melee attack plus eight from embedded heroes in the Lord's army. Honestly, kind of meh. Like, and he then he gets concealment bombs. Like, honestly, this trio of Lord Effects is kind of weak. It's 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 weak sauce, really. Um, in my opinion, compared to Isabella, for example, who gets much more significant buffs to both melee attack and defense for all of her heroes in her army. Um, and then ambush success chance, just kind of meh against AI. Like, okay, you get an offensive ambush fairly often. You can probably max it out to like a hundred percent chance essentially. But is it really? that significant i don't think so i don't think it's that important of a factor uh it doesn't help you in sieges really um most skaven heroes do not benefit much from plus eight melee attack uh because assassins don't have the mass to plow through to wherever they want this actually does matter against ai because ai especially the green caster heroes will just or lords will just camp them behind their lines they're not going to charge them into you so it makes it very hard to try to get in on them with an assassin and the other two hero characters for skaven are not really reliant on their melee attack for damage um the Plague Priest, especially on a Plague Furnace, is just going to melt everything with his AoE aura, and a warp, and a war, a warp Log Engineer doesn't really care. He's not really there for fighting. He's just there for spells and artillery. So, not the hugest fan. I feel like it's kind of a weak sauce improvement. Sigma Bombs, that's just an item. That shouldn't even count as a Lord Effect. That's like an ability he has. I, I don't know. That's very lackluster. Uh, unless it means literally his entire army gets Concealment Bombs, which could be interesting. Conceal bo concealment bombing and help it abomination seems legit now he does get some unique items of course i'm not entirely sure what this will entail from the campaign perspective what buffs we're going to get with these uh if it's going to improve public order or be something useful or if it's going to be one of those garbage items like the cobra mace of mazda mundi which if i remember correctly is like plus three untainted so it might be a total trash item uh from a campaign perspective maybe it'll be a good buff we'll certainly see now for maps Snitch does start in the land of the dervishes in the Southlands, if you're playing on the Eye of the Vortex. Um, so in the Vortex campaign, he's got a location where you're going to be squaring off with a whole host of enemies, really. Uh, I do believe there's you do have um, the the uh, Lizardmen. I actually haven't played Tic-Tac-Toe in uh, the Vortex ever. I've only played him in Mortal Empires, but I do believe Tic-Tac-Toe is down here, if I remember correctly. Um... But that might just be Mortal Empires, actually. Maybe Tic Tac's down somewhere else. But uh, you should certainly have to fight. You should, we'll certainly have to fight Krokgar, who's kind of nearby. Uh, a whole bunch of... There's actually Wood Elf, Wood Elf armies. Um, of course, you do have uh, a lot of Tomb Kings, Arkin, as well as Cetra, are in the area. Dwarves, uh, Sudenberg with the Empire there. Uh, so certainly, you're going to have a wide variety of enemies. You're going to be surrounded by enemies, really. So it might be a bit of a difficult start. Um, it's likely nobody's going to want to be your friend because you're Skaven. Uh, maybe Queek all the way down here, but... Definitely not the most convenient start. Um, Going to be kind of difficult to fortify. This is quite a... It's, it's a little difficult to see, I think, on this map. But it, uh, you can see it's a lot of open terrain. It is a relatively difficult area to fortify and just lock down. So it, it could be a bit of a tough start for Eshin. Uh, certainly not the most challenging, I think. Uh, but combined with the limitations on your unit uh, costs, and it, it could definitely be a little bit of a challenge. Now, in Mortal Empires, this is where it gets interesting. We are actually getting new provinces. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the Desolation of Nagash is where currently the map ends. Uh, you get the Desolation of Nagash, Blightwater, and the Devil's Backbone. And this area, Broken Teeth, Plain of Bones, the Wolflands, and what seems to be Noblar Country, and the Dragon Isles are 
all non-existent currently. So we are going to be getting these. I assume Desolation of Nagash is going to get additional uh, regions. And we are getting, from what I see, one, two, three, four, and five new provinces. And on top of this, keep in mind, CA has promised that supposedly this next the uh this next update is going to reduce turn times by up to 60 percent now obviously if you're running on a toaster that's probably not likely um maybe it's not even going to help higher and maybe if uh, there's sort of a maximum and it, like if you have a higher end pc that's already running at max speed maybe it won't help that much it's only up to 60 percent could be as little as 0 0.1 or whatever percent but supposedly turn times are going to get faster and with that we are also going to get a bigger map so definitely some very exciting stuff uh awesome to see that sort of prep for for warhammer 3 go, going in we are now getting expanding into the um ex, uh, expanding past the world's edge mountain so that's definitely some exciting stuff um it is going to be a little weird playing with a dead zone just ex extending the into this entire northeast corner i i'm not I understand that it's difficult to sort of implement, you know, dozens of provinces or something. Um, but at the same time, it is going to be a little awkward aesthetically. But I'm really not going to complain. I, I, I don't, I don't want to complain. Honestly, I'm really excited. I'm really happy to see more provinces hitting the field. Really happy to see this expansion of territory. It should spice up the campaigns for Kalita, for Krokgar. Uh, honestly, even for Queek, the Dwarves, and um, honestly, all these factions should get a big, in my opinion. Uh, shake up from this from this implementation because it suddenly means that this flank that has for essentially the entire game's life cycle been a safe zone you a crocker can literally sit on his ass here in the corner and not care suddenly he does have to consider this these areas Kalita suddenly has to consider these areas where normally you just lock yourself off from access from this point and um of course uh Queek now has potential to expand perhaps confederate some some skaven and uh of course now Eshid is the new corner camper but um I, I do like the fact that it's going to open up the world a little bit, make life a little more challenging for the dwarves, for the greenskins, shake things up, and just hopefully spice up the campaign. So I'm really excited to see that. Now for unique skills, uh, good old Eshin, or good old uh, Nick does get um, the, uh, his opponents do suffer penalties uh, at the beginning of an ambush battle. I'm not sure if that's like a timed ability or if... Um, it means that they, there's like an ability you proc or whatever when you score an ambush. Uh, it does improve his ambush success chance by 10% on top of the baseline 25%. So he's probably going to be able to 100% his ambush really easily. And reduces enemy leadership by 5 in the local region. This could be very strong against some armies. Now besides that, more campaign movement range is really nice. And charge bonus of plus 8. Not plus 8%, percent, plus 8. So that is going to have a tangible impact on the performance of your infantry, especially. Uh, who normally doesn't have great at charge bonus this could easily double or improve their charge bonus by something like 50 percent or even double it on anything except like plague monks uh rat ogres or chariots so definitely i think a solid improvement there conceal hide them um now this improves speed for all of your infantry not bad for skaven who are pretty nippy to begin with especially night runners and gutter runners who are sitting in the 50s for speed um, um granted not with strength in numbers but still uh, and does grant concealment bombs to gutter runners and night runners. Now this does mean that this ab ability here literally only refers to him, which kind of sucks. Uh, means that there's not going to be other concealment bomb units. But you know, concealment bombs are okay. Not real. I don't really care for this much because in campaign, who cares? As yeah, stupid, <laughs> it's not going to give you a huge boost. But, uh, anything is a better than nothing. Um, upkeep reduction of twenty five percent, and then improved hero and lord recruit ranks in all provinces with contract loopholes definitely a very strong improvement reducing upkeep by 25 percent is just always very good so there's nothing to complain there about there uh he does have just dodge it which improves physical resist by 15 percent keep in mind he does have a baseline of 30 percent so this buffs you up to almost 50 percent resistance melee defense plus five obviously not weak sabotage and unrest which immediately causes siege attrition when besieging enemy settlements uh, and reduce any public order. Now, I actually really like this. I hope we see more abilities like this implemented in the future because right now, sieging someone into starvation or starving out of a city is basically not a viable strategy. It's something you never bother with. You are going to storm a city 99% of the time in campaign. But uh, with this implementation, I think uh, at least Nick should have some benefit from sieging a city for an extended period. And I like that. Now, he does also get two abilities here, Deathmaster Sigil, as well as From the Shadows. I believe one of these is the is the Snare and um, 
damage and uh, vulnerability ability, but I'm not entirely sure which. Certainly should be a nice, uh, nice improvement to him um, and should help him quite a good bit. And of course, in the gallery, we can see some pictures. We can see a starting army is, uh, to put it mildly, not impressive. <laughs> you do get the Eshin Triad by the look of it, who do appear to be a um, relatively small sized unit. You can see only 72 models. This is on. Um, This is on uh, large, so I, I believe that's, I'm trying to think, what that's actually a really weird model count, because this is on ultra, um, and normally uh, you'd have, I guess, I guess you'd end up with 54 models in a unit? That is a really weird number uh, to have at large settings, 54, that's so weird, but um yeah, you do get the Eshin Triad by the look of it. Some Night Runners, some Gutter Runners. Um, nothing too fancy. Uh, as far as his spawn, you can see he's surrounded by Sudenberg, who is immediately at war with you. They hate you. The Empire, of course, hates you. Um, and you can see, of course, him riding some elves. So definitely looking like a bit of fun. Uh, unfortunately, we can't see if his troops do start with a that AP on the Night Runners and Gutter Runners. But um, and it's definitely a very, very weird model count for the triads. But all in all, I do like Eshin's look. I do, I'm pretty excited. Now for Miles Darkblade, uh, the character a lot of people have been waiting for in a little, little while. We of course do know about the demon effects that he can potentially uh, convert towards a, uh, and he can sort of uh, submit to the demon or he can fight back. And depending on that, you get more campaign bonuses or more in battle bonuses um, and certain penalties or benefits, uh, depending on which way you tilt. If you let the demon get more control, uh, you do get a bit fightier, I believe, whereas if you uh, resist the demon, you do get improved campaign bonuses. And honestly, I think the campaign bonuses are going to be more worth it than the demon, but I don't know. Uh, Zarkin Whispers does look like you're going to get certain quests, I would assume, based on Zarkin's uh, suggestions. There's, of course, a military alliance with Nagron, so you do start off relatively strong. Uh, if we look at the map, we can see that, of course, you are starting with a city up in the black uh, a flood or by Nagarond, but you also do start with your Black Arc all the way down in the bottom right hand corner in the Sea of Dread. Um, and it's a similar case in Mortal Empires where you are starting right next to Snitch uh, across the world with your Black Arc. This is an incredibly inconvenient Black Arc position, just gonna be blunt with you guys there. I really don't actually, I'm gonna say I don't like that because your Black Arc is landlocked. This is going, to, you're gonna sweep this up in like. Let's be honest, 50, 60 turns probably, if you decide to go this path, and you're going to be done. And this Black Arc is now worthless. You might as well disband it and get rid of it, um, which I'm not a huge fan of. Uh, I, I I wish the Black Arc spawned like here, so you actually had access to the majority of the world's oceans. Um, so not a huge fan of this, but uh, I apologize. Just, just skip ahead there just to, just to show uh, what, how the impact of that military lines with Nagron, because it is going to matter. If you can get that alliance with Nagron, it should make it much easier to hold Hack Reef. Now, you do get improved income from Iron Mines, Gold Mines, and Marble Quarries. This should actually have an impact if you choose to go the uh, Southern Expansion route. Not so much in Vortex, but especially in Mortal Empires, because of all the Dwarves here, uh, and a lot of the Mines, Iron Mines, as well as Gold Mines being available there, uh, it could have a significant impact. Um, of course, you do get the Mount Spite, which is a cold one. Not much to be said there. Um, Lord Effects, you've got uh, reduced recruitment costs for cold one units and reduced upkeep for cold one units. I really like this. I think it was anticipated that uh, Mouse is going to be the cold one lord. Um, should be fun. Finally, you have a lord where running cold ones is really rewarded or encouraged for the Dark Elves. Because uh, right now, cold ones are kind of a unit you just ignore and don't run in, in real games. But uh, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing some cold one builds in campaign. Should be, should be a lot of fun. Now for unique skills. Some of these are limited to... Um, some of these abilities, some of these uh, unique skills are bound to uh, transforming into Zarkin, so do keep that in mind. He does get the waking, which reduce cooldowns on certain abilities he has. I'm not entirely sure what these abilities entail at the moment, uh, but you do get reduced cooldown on them, uh, and I do believe those improve your stats, make you a little fightier. Uh, pain tolerance, huge buff here for to melee defense with plus ten. Missile resist, honestly, eh, whatever. Uh, I guess if you want to dance in front of a tower and distract it while your troops climb the walls, there you go. Uh, improved ambush success chance, 
An improved intercept, intercept chance. It's okay. I, I probably wouldn't prioritize it, though given that Malice is a fighty lord, so he doesn't have magic to invest in, probably not a worthless item. Uh, giving him stock is also kind of nice. Though once again, I, I'm not that big of a fan of stock in campaign. It's just not that valuable. Um, Slumber, once again, more cooldowns to his abilities, uh, or cooldown reduction to his abilities. Definitely very strong there. Uh, Avatar of Terror grants him leadership. Uh, debuffs to all local enemy armies. This is pretty insane. Minus 7. Very, very powerful. Um, now you just got to confederate uh, Felhart for that minus 4. But um, in all seriousness, minus 7 to all local enemy armies is very strong. Especially against like green skins, which you could be fighting a lot early on with your uh, Black Ark uh, or Skaven. So potentially strong. And Terror, of course, is nice. Uh, though, unfortunately, it only gives you this while you're transformed into Zarkin. Now, with Supernatural Tissue, you get improved replenishment rates for your army, which is very nice, as well as a ward save. Uh, the main thing here, I would say, is the replenishment rate, but ward save is always nice, even if only while well, transformed into Zarkin. Cold Heart, definitely good. Give vigor loss reduction of minus 50% for cold ones is going to make them much more resilient, much more effective into long term and grind, grind. So I definitely like that. Campaign movement range plus 5%, and then attrition reduction, not bad. I'm, I don't usually care too much about attrition reductions, but, you know, if you want to expand it to Norskin territory into some unfriendly lands, it can be useful. Uh, Drakow Tyrant, on turn start, lords in the character's region have a chance to gain loyalty. You know, not bad. Not 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 great, but not bad. Um, public order plus 3. I assume this should just be plus 3 and not plus 3%. If it's plus 3%, that is beyond a joke tier, but I assume it's plus 3, which is not bad. It's not amazing, but certainly not terrible. Uh, and minus 10% upkeep for all units in the Lord's Army, which, you know, stacks on top of your 50% reduction in Cold War Knight, so minus 60%. Very solid. You stack that on top of your blue line items, and you can have near free Cold Ones, I think, uh, which would be, uh, just crack open all those Cold Ones, guys. They're free. But in, in all seriousness, that, that is going to be a pretty big bump. And then Contempt and Hatred. I, I love this description. 20% damage when fighting against anything and everything. Uh, yeah, that's that sounds about right. Um, so that is going to be a significant, you know, it's a boost. It's an extra 20%. I think his baseline weapon strength is 40, 440. So another 20% on top of that, uh, you're looking at an extra 88 weapon strength. Bad bumps you up over 500. And that's... that's Big buff, especially for a single skill point. I definitely like it. I, I do like... I think I like Malice's layout of Lord Effects especially a bit better than I do like Snitches. Um, but we shall certainly see how he plays out. Like I said, one of the things I'm not a big fan of at all is his is his Black Arc deployment in Mortal Empires. I think it's just bad. Now, once, more, once we do get Warhammer 3, perhaps there will be more ocean to explore. Uh, like, heading towards End. We might not necessarily get End, but it could aim towards end and maybe we could get a loop around maybe maybe if they sort out the turn issue we could get a loop around the southlands um to connect the oceans but as it stands now where the oceans are not interconnected this is just such a crappy spot for a black arc you're not going to get value out of it after your first less than 100 turns in my opinion unless you like choose to expand northward but yeah, i don't know yeah it's just not that good and it for images in the gallery, we do have, of course, Malice looking dapper on Spite. Um, we can see his starting roster. He does get a Bloodrack Medusa, um, as well as the uh, as well as what appears to be the Scourge Runner Chariots and some Cold War Knights. So not a terrible start. Uh, certainly fairly solid. Um, it also looks like he does start near his Black Arc. So I guess the idea is that this should be your area of expansion and not Hag Reef. But, uh, you know, it's a decent starting roster. The Medusa, while I don't think it's a great unit from what I've seen so far of its stats and abilities. Um, and it looks like you also do get start with a hero, which is very, very strong. But while I'm not super, super impressed with the uh, Medusa, I think that for an early game unit, it's going to be stupidly strong. And honestly, it's not a bad unit. It's still a 1,750 gold unit. A uh, very strong monster regardless. Uh, we can see some of the uh, buildings for the um, for the uh, Black Ark by the look of it. I actually believe this is a unique building now for the Black Ark, the Palace of Dread Knights. Because uh, off the top of my head, and I could be wrong, Black Arcs do not get access to uh, the most of the cavalry options. And they don't get access to the elite infantry like Black Guard or Harkoneth Executioner. So I, I do like that implementation there. Um, of course, there we do see the Medusa. 
and uh, yeah, we're back around. So, all in all, uh, I would say it looks pretty solid. I, I definitely like them. Um, I did mention my critiques. I, I'm i not thrilled with that Black Arc starting position. I don't like the isolation of it on the greater map in Mortal Empires. Um, like I said, I feel that like, Snitch's army effects are a little lackluster. It might as well be summed up as ambush success chance improvements, 25%, because the rest of it is just kind of crap. But... Uh, should certainly be interesting. Both lords are definitely oriented towards a certain play style, uh, and I, th I think it should be, should be a good bit of fun. I'm definitely also looking forward to just see where Rapunz falls into this as well. Uh, and honestly, one of the biggest things I'm thrilled about is the new territorial expansion in Mortal Empires. Um, the fact that CA is reducing turn time supposedly and getting us more and more, uh, more and more territory to conquer is really fun. And I think it's really going to open more opportunities going into the future and sort of giving us a taste of what Warhammer 3 is going to be like. So regardless, I know it was a bit of a long one. I probably ranted much more than I should have, but I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Hope you found it entertaining and at least a little fun. Uh, definitely leave all your thoughts, comments, critiques, opinions down below. If you have heard something that I've just missed or you've seen something that I've missed in regards to Rapunz or uh, any of the incoming content, certainly share it down below. I'd love to hear about it. And uh, I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now.